I've got a 37 hours flight from London, so hopefully I'll survive the next uh, 25 minutes. Um, my name's Franz Schreiner. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Brave New Coin, a uh, data and research company. I got introduced to Bitcoin in 2010, and it was uh, actually a guy in this room. He ran to me with his laptop screaming, I found the block! And I thought, what are you on about? He almost bowled some people over, you know, beers are flying everywhere, and said, oh, I, I used my computer, I downloaded some software, and, and I made 50 Bitcoins mining this block. And I thought, that sounds like magical internet money. And you know, how much is it worth? Um, 10 cents each or whatever. I said, okay, call me when it's worth something. And in 2013, I think it was, he said, uh, you remember that Bitcoin stuff? It's now worth 40 bucks each or so. And I thought, oh, okay, now I'm listening. So I read the white paper. I basically went down a very deep rabbit hole. And I realized this is a whole new asset class. This has some you know, ramifications that interest me. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, uh, the deceptive moving into the exponential, uh, a body of work that we've been working on for six months plus now, uh, taxonomy for the asset class, our efforts to integrate this asset class into the capital markets, and a little bit of prediction and trends or outlook. So as humans, we're very much used to thinking about things in a linear way. You know, uh, the size and growth of the property market or the nation's GDP, you know, one, two, three, four, five. But exponential technology comes along and digitizes something and then democratizes something and it goes exponential. But during those early days, it looks like not much is happening. Right? So a lot of infrastructure needs to be built. A lot of on-ramps, off-ramps, protocols, standards. Same thing happened with the internet days. So what does this asset class look like? inside the linear versus exponential curve. Well, it all started with Bitcoin, essentially digitizing currency, and then it moved into, well, now everything you could possibly imagine. And, you know, we are here. We're just breaking out of that exponential or deceptive stage, should I say, into the exponential now. I mean, let's take a look at Bitcoin, a $25.5 billion market cap. Right? Uh, back when I got introduced to it, it was worth barely anything. And if you look at it on a, on a chart like this, it looks like we're in the next bubble. But if you zoom out and extrapolate it out far enough, um, it hasn't even begun. There's so much you know, cheap capital out there, uh, people looking to park their money. And the more that this asset class becomes institu institutionalized, the easier it is to move money into crypto. And of course, Bitcoin is just the first of many. We now have <laughs> currencies that represent gold and uh, revenues out of properties, and, and there's all sorts of regulatory considerations um, that need to be solved. But uh, if, if you can think of a sector, somebody is trying to turn it into a blockchain-based digital asset to commoditize um, to date. Uh, you know, illiquid assets. Like imagine trading the brand value of Adidas or Nike as a brand and actually speculating on the, on the brand value. Or taking a hot desk or an entire floor of a, of a rental building and commoditizing the revenue stream, you know, scaling it up and down uh, any which way you could imagine. The combined market capitalization of all the digital assets today is about $40 billion. So again, you can see that kind of breaking out of the deceptive stage as that infrastructure comes out of the lab and into the wilds. So, you know, we're still very early in this thing. Um, I hosted a conference in 2014 called Bitcoin South, and we had a panel there. I think Andreas was on it, and I said to the crowd, you know, you're all the lunatic fringe. And because we weren't, we weren't even at the early adopter or let alone innovator stage then, I think we're barely at the sort of innovator, arguably, possibly, maybe early adopter stage now, but very much early on. And we can look at charts like the classical sort of psychology of market cycles, and we might be staring at huge increases of late and think, oh, we're entering a new bubble. But um, all of cryptocurrencies market capitalization combined is traded every 40 minutes on the forex market. Right? It's still a drop in the bucket globally. So. How do we get this asset class to mature? Um, I believe one of the key things is just to have a common language to be able to communicate. 
so we've spent a long time putting together a taxonomy. This is a small sort of peek into this body of work. It'll be published and made available online and for our newsletters and uh, all the rest after we've consolidated the feedback. But we'll just uh, take a look at it. So a uh, global classification standard. This is based on uh, Robert Greer's work of the superclasses of assets. So you know you have capital assets such as equities, bonds, and income-producing real estate. You have uh, consumable, transformative assets such as physical commodities, precious metals, and stores of value. Again, gold, currencies, fine art, etc. Uh, we're arguing that now there's a fourth superclass of assets, which is digital assets or cryptographic assets. So our digital asset taxonomy is a global classification standard destined to all market participants involved in the investment process. It's designed to capture and assess the impact of global, regional, and local trends in the ecosystem, compare and report on industry sector exposures versus peers or benchmarks, and pinpoint industry investment opportunities across developed and emerging markets. So there was an excellent paper written by uh, White and Berth um, out of Coinbase and ARK Investments. It was titled Ringing the Bell for a New Asset Class. And they built on Greer's work as well, and we built upon uh, uh, that work. So DAT's basis for a definition of digital assets as a fourth superclass um, of assets under Greer's classification. So I think the reason that this is possible is um, because of the attributes of digital assets. It can be transferred electronically at high speeds, zero marginal cost with a high degree of resiliency. Oh, it's a double up there. Uh, so another academic, uh, General Brown, um, put it nicely, you know, that, that these assets are underpinned by technology that enables parties who don't fully trust each other to form and maintain cons consensus um, about existence, status, and evolution of facts on the system. And uh, digital asset taxonomy essentially has properties of, um, well, this new superclass has properties of all three uh, existing superclasses. Um, so within the taxonomy f or families of uh, um, the subclasses, we have general digital assets, and those are used for payments uh, or platforms, and protocol tokens, which are uh, for side chains and what we call app coins. Again, we'll make the full taxonomy available um, in a couple of weeks. So goods that can function simultaneously as all three, capital assets, consumable, transferable, and store of value, thanks to the distrib distributed and cryptographically secure nature. So just to quickly define the subclasses, you know, payment assets like um, uh, Monero or Zcash are defined as general form of money with the potential to capture global M2 money supply. And definition of platform assets is uh, not limited to just the peer-to-peer -peer electronic transfer of value. Uh, these are distributed protocols that integrate high level of uh, programmability or programming, such as Ethereum and uh, quite a few others now. Um, I, I think it's great that you can not just uh, transfer value um, seamlessly, peer to peer, globally. I think that is the killer app, but to now be able to actually program your money, you know, that's fantastic. Um, I love the analogy of, you know, you, uh, you buy a, a driverless car, um, you get hit by a bus, you stop making your automatic smart contract payments to, to pay off the vehicle, the car repossesses itself, right? We're, we're going to see some fun nuances when this technology starts to come out in a big way. I'm not going to go through the definition of all of them, but um, we've uh, employed a both qualitative and quantitative um, set of data to put this um, body of research together. Um, so that we can have, you know, standardized classifications assigned to each niche or, or sub-asset class. Uh, so we've looked at everything from, the, you know, the hash rate, the algorithm, uh, price, volume, volatility, everything you could imagine to put this together. And we've identified that there is um, tons of uh, uh, sort of industry-specific uh, classifications. So, for example, um, we have a client called Mobile Go. They created a token to power essentially a uh, mobile gaming platform. So you can you know, swap items inside the game uh, with less friction and more features and all the rest. Um, and what we're finding is that you know, we, we now know of several uh, fund managers who 
have their own kind of quasi classifications where they'll go and buy up several or all of um, uh, the coins in a certain subclass. So there's about five different coins that target gaming, and they'll just buy all of them and you know put five or ten percent uh, of their portfolio into that entire subclass. So it helps with you know investment thesis and, and all the rest. But um, obviously every sector imaginable is um, being addressed by some entrepreneur somewhere with, with a blockchain token. So again, we'll make the taxonomy available shortly um, and it's general use and free to use. Now quickly some predictions and trends. This is where I say some outrageous things. Um, but before I do, you know, a lot of people compare the blockchain to uh, the days of the internet. Um, unlike the internet, we don't need to put copper and wires and fiber throughout the planet under the sea. Right? It's going to be much faster, but it's still going to take a long time. Now with the internet, you know, you've got your cell phone, you can use Uber, you can use Facebook. The value is in the application layer. And a lot of people argue that the value is actually in the protocol level with the blockchain. I'm not 100% sold on that. Maybe it's not quite, you know, 90-10, like 60-40. But um, I do believe that the first trillion dollar applications are going to be blockchain-based um, uh, protocol uh, focused application or protocol layer uh, projects. So, I think there's an entire slide missing. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Um, what I was going to say about uh, predictions is I believe that uh, Bitcoin's probably going to go up in value a lot and then crash horrendously and people are going to call bubble. But within two decades, we'll probably see Bitcoin sitting at about 100,000 each, if not more. Just simple you know, deflationary currency, there's less coins being created, more people wanting to use it, basic supply and demand. We're going to see more and more on ramps and off ramps, or exchange traded products, and you know, uh, insured or, or underwritten and secured um, ways for institutional capital to get involved. Um, and uh, I can't remember the other points, unfortunately. But um, What's required to grow is, uh, you know, think of yourself as like UBS or, or maybe someone from UBS here. If you want to participate in this asset class, you might not even, as an asset manager, be able to participate because the market cap is less than $100 billion, right? You've got rules and regulations and internal policies and, and all the rest. So um, you need market data for backtesting and um, portfolio attribution. So that services the, the buy side. Uh, you need uh, index solutions to create products and derivatives and other uh, tradables on top. Uh, there's an entire decentralized part of this uh, asset class, which um, you've heard about smart contracts. Right? There's nothing smart or contractual about them. If you want to create some kind of decentralized swap contract, how are you going to get the LIBOR rate or some Forex um, rates into um, your smart contract? You need something called oracles. So that's Part of what we do, financial oracles to power decentralized trade. You need manufacturers and issuers, the S&P Dow Jones and the MSCI of this world to go, hey, this, uh, we're getting a lot of demand here. Uh, let's create some you know, structured income products or whatnot. Um, and of course, you need more safe, insured, and compliant trading venues. Uh, when we started tracking the Bitcoin exchanges, I think there was like 10 at, at best. There's now 150 and growing. Um, you need unobtrusive regulation, but you also need investor protection. Um, and I think New Zealand is a great place to actually attract and manage international digital capital. Um, ah, just the other way around. And to finish off the predictions, I think about 15% of the world's transactions are going to be parsed or at least uh, um, well, settled or at least parsed over some form of blockchain. And I think several countries are going to issue a cryptographic um, assets as their national currency. So super quickly to finish off our efforts in the space, the, the activities that have kept me and uh, our group busy for the last three and a half years, well, there's the Blockchain Association of New Zealand. We're founding members of that. It's a public-private uh, forum, industry group, communicates uh, and distributes information about local, regional, and global efforts and trends, uh, not-for-profit, uh, membership-based, with regular events and uh, workshops. I encourage you all to join, obviously. Uh, there's Blockchain Labs, who've put on this fabulous event, um, co-founder of that, and that's come out of a need for Enterprise New Zealand and abroad, looking for 
you know, uh, everything from executive workshops and understanding this uh, a lot better, right through to, you know, executive technical business development workshops, rapid prototyping, full-scale agile development, uh, where we can say, right, is this right for blockchain? Let's test it out. If so, uh, we can have an agile development framework to actually build it out. Um, Stephen previously mentioned digital asset exchange, or DASIT, is coming. So NZ Base, fully compliant. Um, start off in New Zealand, servicing the local needs, and then expands internationally, uh, hopefully in 2017. And that'll be live in about three months. And lastly, brand new coins. So as I said, we, uh, we track everything um, on, tr on chain, as we call it, and off chain transactions. So that's what people trade, the transactions on the blockchains, the industry deal flow, um, and that can be used for a variety of uh, different things. And we distribute our data to developers through marketplaces like MassShape and Quandle, and through the old plumbing, as we call it, uh, the financial world, market data world, the uh, Tullets and ICAPs. Um, we also get involved with, um, you know, before these things are traded somewhere, uh, actually helping companies um, put together uh, a crypto coin um, coherently and legally. Uh, we don't get involved in the legalese, but uh, we've certainly been around long enough to see uh, what works and what doesn't. So uh, I think I'm out of time. Um, I don't know if there's room for any questions, but thank you very much.